All right, well, let's begin our lectionary Bible study. Well, this is proper 23 in the 1979 prayer book lectionary. Begin with the collect. Lord, we pray thee that thy grace may always proceed and follow us and make us continually to be given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Of course, the emphasis here in the collect is on God's grace, God's provision, looking out for us. Uh, if memory serves, this is one where they uh, tweak the language just uh, slightly uh, to get rid of the word prevent. Um, and that goes back quite a ways. Uh, just the other day, we were looking at that. Um, uh, direct us, O Lord, in all our doings that with thy most gracious favor. That um, um, I'll forget how it goes after that. But anyway, the, the 1662 was uh, prevent us, O Lord, with thy gracious favor. And they had changed it to direct here, it, I suspect probably the original is, uh, uh, we pray that thy grace may always prevent and follow us. Uh, the difficulty is we just don't use that word in that way anymore. Prevent means to go before. Um, but that's the idea, that God's grace, prevenient grace. We still call it prevenient grace, though, even though we don't use the word prevent. We've kind of excised it from the prayer book. Um, but God's grace, prevenient grace, is that which goes before and prepares the way softens the hearts and gets us ready to listen and receive and so on. And so here it's like there's a there's a, a bubble of grace going before and following up after. Um, and it's, a lot of times we're just not cognizant of the way that we are surrounded by God's goodness and the way he's looking out for us. And uh, we, we live in the moment because that's where we are, but we... Uh, tend to lose sight of what goes before and what comes after. So this collect is a good reminder of that. We begin with the book of Ruth. Uh, it diverges from the Roman Catholic original in the first reading. Uh, theirs is from, uh, I think it's 2 Kings. It's the story of uh, Naaman being healed um, by uh, Elisha. And he's being healed of leprosy, which makes perfect sense because that's what the gospel is about, healings of leprosy. But here, for some reason, they decided to change it to the book of Ruth. And there's an optional shorter and longer version. We have the full version printed out for you here. Um, verses 1 through 7 can be skipped over. Um, but this one is a little more difficult when you skip over it because you have to come up with something to kind of lay the context. So the, the lectionary books give you about an extra line or two of summarizing verses 1 through 7 so you know what in the world you're talking about by the time you start out in verse 8. But we'll look at Ruth 1, verses 1 through 19. Well, actually, before we get there, let's give a little background about Ruth. Uh, the, the setting of this uh, historically is in the era of the judges, so this is before uh, the coalescing of the nation-state and the beginning of the monarchy. So it's kind of a, a Wild West, a uh, little bit of chaotic time. Is Ruth a, considered a book of judges? I mean, with the judges? Well, Ruth is not a judge, but, but it's in that era. Just in the era, she's not, okay. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of considered... You know, dark days, chaotic days uh, before the birth of the nation. Um, the theological contribution to the Bible, um, of course, her life gives a beautiful example of God's providence. So perhaps that's why this re uh, lesson was chosen, because providence is the theme of the collect. Um, so God brings Ruth to precisely the right field where she can happen to meet Boaz, who will be her kinsman and redeemer. God is also portrayed in the book as a model of loyal and abiding love. So it's a great love story, and also a story of redemption and uh, healing. In fact, there, that's kind of a play on the key word there, kinsman, redeemer. The one Hebrew word, goel, appears 13 times in Ruth and basically means one who redeems, even though here it's used as kinsman. Goel, uh, Gimel, Aleph, Lamed. 
Goel. G O E L. You really want the Hebrew spelling, didn't you? The, the story begins with a famine, and the famine uh, that's going on is uh, taken as a sign of disobedience and apostasy <coughs> of the nations. There's a lot of you know, hedging your bets religiously among the Israelites, as there was from the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. You know, people have their, their backup idols, um, and that's been a problem. And they, they feel like they're under um, God's wrath because of that. There's an, Imel, uh, there's an Israelite named Elimelech, who, whose name means my king, or sorry, God is my king. Uh, in a desperate act, he moves from Bethlehem uh, to Moab. And there's a kind of a ironic uh, twist to that, in that Bethlehem means house of bread. There's a famine in the house of bread, so he moves to a desolate place in order to escape the famine. Although, so although he seeks life in Moab, he and his two sons, Mahon and Chilion, whose names mean sick and pining, uh, Sick and what? Pining, pining, like pining for the oh, pining. fjords. Pining. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they only find death. Um, the diseased sons leave two Moabite widows, Orpah, people usually mispronounce that, Oprah, when they get to it. Um, Orpah means stubbornness, and then the other widow is Ruth, whose name means friendship. So she's got the only positive name among all these people. Elimelech's widow, Naomi, hears that the famine in Israel is over and decides to return, no longer as Naomi, which means pleasant, but now as Mara, which means bitter. And she tells her daughters-in-law to remain in Moab and remarry. Orpah chooses to leave Naomi and is never mentioned again. Ruth, on the other hand, resolves to cling to Naomi and follow the God of Israel. She therefore gives up her culture, her people, and language because of her love. And that's basically where we get in that first chapter. So let's look at the reading. Ruth 1, 1 through 19. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Mahon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived about ten years, and both May sorry, Malon and Chilion died, so that the women were bereft of her two sons and her husband. Then she started with her daughter-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the con that in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But she was with her two daughters-in-law, Sorry, But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find home, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and she lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you. 
For where you will go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if even death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. So it's a great story of affection and family, and um, the the mother-in-law uh, basically wants the best for these two daughters-in-law and tries to say, you know, go go back where you came from and try to make good lives for yourselves, and you know, you're you're still young and and uh, you you've got time to to fix this situation that you're in. You know, you don't have to be a widow forever. I'm I'm, I'm past my marrying age. I don't want to get out there on Match.com and find me a new husband or anything like that. I'm, I'm just going to go back home and live out my days as a widow. But, you know, you, you're young. Go make lives for yourselves. And um, so Orpah goes back home, but uh, Ruth uh, just doesn't want to leave. She has really made family, and so much so that she crosses the boundaries of culture and of religion. Um, of course, in, in those days, it was they had a different perspective, you know, especially in the pagan world, about, um, you know, different people groups had their own gods, and different places had their own gods. So it's not quite so strange for her to say, you know, if I'm going to go live with your people in your land, I'm, you know, your gods are going to be my gods. Um, she comes to a, a fuller understanding of all that, of course. Um, so that's not too foreign to the pagan mindset that you would exchange your gods for new gods if you go to a new place and become a part of a new people. But nevertheless, of course, this is part of God's provision and the unfolding of um, the love story uh, that he has planned for her with God and with that new husband in a new land. And we should always keep in mind that this uh, is a Gentile uh, pagan woman who is grafted into Israel and, in fact, becomes one of the ancestors of David. And so that's part of the lineage of David, too, is that um, he has uh, these sort of oddities in his family tree. Um, let me see. What's the name of the... Yeah. What, what's the name of the... Um, in the uh, mine has just gone totally blank here. You know, where they march around the city seven times and Jericho. Jericho and the Rahab, the harlot. the harlot. Yeah, I think she's in the she family is. tree. In fact, it's kind of interesting because she, Paul talks about, he mentions her name. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and she appears in the Bible like for two or three verses. Of, and she was so monumental that she appears in the New Testament. Yeah. yeah. One small act of obedience to God. Mm -hmm. It's weird how that story appears in so many children's books. The Jericho? Or yeah, well, Rahab? Jericho and Rahab, you know, there. Just to get those raised hands. What is a harlot? <laughs> <laughs> what is circumcision? You always get those. You don't own anything. It's the only thing you own are your sins. Mm -hmm. 
in a sense, we're all really new. And that's another part of the story of Ruth that I forgot to mention is the, the, the provision angle is that she starts, at least at the beginning of the book, uh, in famine, poverty, and widowhood, and ends up, you know, with husband, family, wealth. Um, so that's part of the provision story, too. Well, let's look at the psalm. Um, we also diverge on the psalm here. We go to 148. Oh, wait a minute, we don't go 148. Hold on. Is that right? Let me look at this. 113. That's wrong. It should be 113. I have to make sure we fix that. 113 is a one of the what's called the Egyptian Psalms. Uh, basically, these are used at Passover, and they're the the songs of slaves um, who are rejoicing in um, being able to leave their bondage and proceed forth the promised land. So it goes like this, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raises up the poor from the dust and lifts, his, sorry, lifts the needy from the ash heap. He makes them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. So you note there at the end of that psalm too, you have this theme of provision and uh, God's prevenient grace providing uh, and watching over and, uh, of course, guiding the, the people to their new land, but more individually, um, lifting up the poor from the dust and the ash heap and making them to sit at the king's table. Um, this translation uses it's simple out of the dust and the poor out of the land. I kind of like that translation better. What was that? Number okay. six, verse six. So I guess we got the right psalm. We just got the wrong address there at the top. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, of course, the Coverdale on the printout. Because simple is a little bit broader than poor and needy. Is, um, well, the, I just like that translation. Yeah. This, this one is more literal. Well, let's look at uh, the epistle, which is uh, 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 15. And uh, this is, of course, we, we, we should note that scholars don't usually think that Paul actually wrote this, although some say maybe uh, bits and pieces of it were just embellished or something like that. Um, so Father Fuller points out that we think that at least some of the lines here are at least a part of a genuine farewell. I think it's all a bunch of nonsense. Um, it's just so, Amen. It's so thin um, speculation. On this part. Anyway, either way, we do have a farewell from Paul to Timothy here. And he's reflecting the time of his life where he's most likely writing from prison um, in Rome, uh, awaiting his martyrdom, and uh, reflecting on his own life and uh, wishing uh, Timothy the best and, and the church uh, that he's labored for and so on. So let's look at this passage, 2 Timothy 2. 3 through 15. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier on service gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to satisfy the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will grant you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descended from David, as preached in my gospel, the gospel for which I am suffering and wearing fetters like a criminal. But the word of God is not fettered. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus with its eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, 
we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and charge them before the Lord to avoid disputing about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And it's interesting in the, uh, in the letter, the two verses that follow go on to give an example of, of uh, people who have not rightly handled the word of truth and uh, do get into much disputations about uh, strange doctrines. Uh, let see, what were their names? Hymenius and, what is it? Hymenius and Philetus. So he gives some bad ex- specific examples. Don't be like those guys. Go for infamy being <laughs> Well, there's a a number of interesting things that he points out. Uh, He talks about um, how he's confident that the uh, that the labor that he's um, gone through in the ministry uh, will bear fruit beyond what he can see, and he says that um, being in God's service is like being a good soldier, Um, and a good soldier stays faithful to his charge. Uh, He doesn't kind of wander off and get bogged down in non-soldier things. Um, stays focused, and that kind of, you can see how one thought leads to another. You know, like an athlete, he stays focused. Uh, He doesn't run off course. He competes according to the rules. Um, If he doesn't play by the rules, he's not going to be rewarded. So one thought leading to another, he gets on the idea of reward. And so he says, for example, the farmer, uh, he gets rewarded for his labors, the fruit of the crops. And so he brings up this uh, idea of merit, And uh, Father Fuller notes, um, here we have a scriptural understanding uh, for the development of the doctrine of of the merits of the saints. Suffering offered obediently to God is like prayer in that it contributes to the furthering of God's saving purpose. And Paul refers to that several times, and it's always characterized as a mystery, um, kind of in both senses. Mystery in the sense of a profound thing, and mystery in the sense of something difficult to grasp and understand. So I thought I'd turn to the uh, passage from the uh, Pocket Catholic Dictionary about merit um, to unpack this a little bit. So it says, merit, divine reward for the practice of virtue. And remember, virtue or good habits. It is Catholic doctrine that by his good works, a person in the state of grace really acquires a claim to supernatural reward from God. So merit and reward are intertwined. They go hand in hand. There's no reward without merit. And we should digress at that point and say, if that, if that puzzles you, remember, um, because we stay so focused on, well, we're saved by God's grace, you know, we can't earn salvation, that's how we get into heaven. Um, but yet at the same time, the Bible consistently talks about reward and punishment. And somehow we picked up the idea that like heaven is the same for everybody. Um, and that hell is the same for everybody. Um, but that's not the case. Just like life in the here and the now is not the same for everybody. Um, so you might, for example, um, picture like heaven being like a concert. And, you know, you, you got your ticket. It was free. Um, and some people got their tickets, they just show up and, you know, they're not ready for it at all. Uh, but other people have been getting ready their whole lives. They've been studying the music that's going to be performed. They've gotten, uh, all their outfit squared away that they want to wear. They, uh, they know the way to their seat, you know, they, everything, all their ducks are in a row. And so they get more out of the experience than the person who just shows up. Perhaps that could be a helpful analogy of understanding how merit and reward fit into the idea of we're saved by God's goodness and grace in spite of our works. We don't earn our way to heaven, and yet we are at the same time rewarded in heaven. 
So back to, back to this. So good works of a person in a state of grace acquire a claim to supernatural reward. And so the, the Council of Orange uh, in 388 says, quote, the reward given for good works is not won by reason of actions which precede grace, but grace, which is unmerited, precedes actions in order that they may be performed meritoriously. So again, we go back to that prevenient grace idea. Certain conditions must be present to make supernatural merit possible. The meritorious work must be morally good, that is, in accordance with the moral law and its object, intent, and circumstances. It must be done freely, without any external coercion or internal necessity. So, you know, not accidentally. It must be supernatural, that is, aroused and accompanied by actual grace, and proceeding from a supernatural motive. We might say, not just good works because you're a nice guy, but good works because you love God. So you're trying to be like God. So, The person must be a wayfarer here on earth, since no one can merit after death. Strictly speaking, only a person in the state of grace can merit, as defined by the church. Merit depends on the free ordinance of God to reward with everlasting happiness the good works performed by his grace. On account of the infinite distance between creator and creature, a human being alone cannot make God his or her debtor if God does not do so by his own free ordinance. That is, even though we're saying God will reward you, it's not that God owes you anything. It's just that he's pleased with you. That God has made such an ordinance is clear from his frequent promises, like the Beatitudes and the prediction of the Last Judgment. The object of supernatural merit is an increase of sanctifying grace, eternal life, when the person has divine friendship, and an increase of heavenly glory. So Paul does allude to the idea of merit in heaven, um, and we see that in the, the examples that he provides in an increasing way. Uh, the soldier, n not so much at first, that's more like he just does his duty. But then we see the athlete, well, he gets the prize. And the farmer, he gets the crops. And so he says, basically, Timothy, it's worth it. It may not always look like it's worth it, may not always feel like it's worth it, but keep on, be a faithful soldier. You will find, as I have, even here in prison, that yes, it has all been worth it. And that leads him to, we think, quote, perhaps an ancient hymn or something like that. It seems quite poetic. Uh, verse 11, um, if we say we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And I'm always intrigued by that last uh, verse there in 13. Um, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. That is, we belong to Christ. Christ has put his mark of identity on us put his spirit within us. And how can he deny us? Well, it's clearly an allusion to other parts of scripture. Um, the words of Jesus, uh, I forget which parable it is, but it's one of the last judgment parables about the king will say, I never knew you. Um, and there might be some other cross-references there too. In fact, I might see if there's any annotations here. Which verse is that? 13... 12. B, let's see. Oh, 1 Timothy 5 8. Let's see what that says. 1 Timothy 5 8. If anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Well, this doesn't quite fit. I mean, there's the denying him, but I think it's Matthew 10:33. That'd probably be the one that's more direct. Seems like a contradictory sentence. We don't deny him; he will, he will deny us. He remains faithful; he cannot deny us. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it deliberately is patching two things together like that don't seem like they go together, yeah. but they are two, you know. Parts of divine revelation. Let's see, Matthew 10, 33. 
one of these parables of the king. The very hairs of your head are numbered. That doesn't make sense. These cross-references are terrible. Well, that's what we got. What I came up with is better, but I don't know the address. And then in his, in his parting words there in first, verse 14, remind them, Timothy, your, your, your people, remind them of this. So, you know, don't just take my word to heart yourself, but tell your people how it's worth it, uh, about how God rewards them, even when the going is tough and it doesn't seem like there's any positive outcome. And it, it could be that... Um, we, we don't know exactly what the reference is here, but when it comes to the idea of, you know, don't be getting into all this disputation about words, which doesn't do any good, um, that perhaps that relates back to this theme of reward, God's provision. Um, I mean, it's, it sounds an awful like like prosperity gospel stuff. Don't get into that mess. You know, people get distracted by that. They think that the gospel is some sort of... A, magic formula to, you know, attain wealth and prosperity and such like that. It's also a, a warning again to, the, to, to the theologians or important people, which is we, we get into these disputes, the church has gotten into this, this, these disputes of, mm-hmm. over words. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't say to Timothy, if I'm reading this right, he doesn't tell Timothy... Don't dispute about words. You know, don't get into theology. But he tells Timothy to tell the people, don't get into these fight about, about theology, but willing, be willing to listen to your teachers, I guess. He doesn't go on to say that here, but I think that's the idea that he's getting to. In verse 15, and instead of getting into these arguments with these false teachers, uh, remind them to just... Again, where he started, be a good soldier in, for Christ. Uh, try to present yourself to God as one who uh, is approved, a good workman, rightly handling the word of truth. And rightly handling the word of truth means putting it into practice, living as if it were actually true. Well, let's turn to the gospel. Um, actually, before we do that, I want to read the uh, passage on leprosy. From uh, This is a wonderful book, The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. I've used this again and again, and it's one of my top resources that I go back to. And it basically just goes through all these kinds of symbols, and not even symbols, but all kinds of things in the Bible, and flushes out all the references um, that kind of... It was... It came from uh, IVP, University Press. So the entry on leper and leprosy, it says, the biblical word translated leprosy does not at least usually refer to what we call leprosy or Hansen's disease, but rather a variety of skin diseases, including the different forms of psoriasis and vitiligo. I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. It's a spell. Uh, V-I-T-I-L-I-G-O, both of which make the skin white and so on. The leprosy in Leviticus that contaminates clothing or a house is probably mold or mildew. These diseases are associated with uncleanness and entail separation from others. But that segregation is not complete isolation, for although Leviticus 13 might mean that lepers should live by themselves, in both New Testament, or sorry, in both Testaments, Lepers have dealings with other people. One nowhere reads of leper colonies. On the contrary, lepers advertise their presence by wearing ragged clothing, looking unkempt, and crying out, unclean, unclean, according to Leviticus 13. The legislation on leprosy, which makes unpleasant reading, appears in Leviticus 13 and 14. It's addressed to priests and intended to give them the expertise to diagnose when a skin eruption is truly leprous. It also instructs what rituals should be performed upon remission. And I find that fascinating. I mean, it's, it's very extensive about, you know, the sacrifice you make, like it's a, a bird and 
how you handle the bird and what you do with the bird and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's nothing uh, said in, in that passage about hygiene or treatment. So it's just about the ritual part of it, not about the doctor's part of it. Lepers are the living dead. In Numbers 12, 12, the flesh of the leper is, quote, as of one dead. And in Job 18, 13, Job's skin is, quote, consumed. The firstborn of death consumes his limbs. When the unnamed king of Israel is asked to heal a leper, he responds with, quote, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Leprosy can be a divine punishment, as in Numbers 12 and 2 Chronicles 26, but God in his mercy also heals lepers. Instances include Numbers 12, Miriam's seven-day leprosy, and 2 Kings 5, Elisha heals Naaman, uh, Mark 1, Jesus heals an unnamed leper, and our story in Luke 17, Jesus healing the ten Samaritan lepers. Because of the dreadful effects of leprosy and the isolation it brings, it may be seen as a picture of sin, but that is not a primary connotation in Scripture. It far more symbolizes the tragic element of life and human vulnerability. When Elisha declares, let him name and come to me now, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel, the implication is that only a prophet can heal leprosy. This is consistent with the circumstance that it is Moses, Elisha, and Jesus who heal lepers in the Bible. It also helps explain Matthew 11 and Luke 7, where Luke refers, sorry, where Jesus refers to his ability to heal lepers as a sign that he is, quote, the coming one. Although Ma uh, uh, Matthew 10 also gives the authority to heal lepers in extension to the disciple. The beggar in Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus is said to have sores that the dogs lick. Although the text is silent on the matter, tradition has spe specified his disease as leprosy. This explains the designation of medieval leper houses as Lazarus. The depiction of Lazarus of Bethany as a leper has often been conflated with the figure in Luke's parable, and the use of Lazarusian as an adjective for leprous conditions, as in Kipling's words about Gunga Din having Lazarusian leather. So, all about lepers. Leather? Yes. Le Lazarus. Yeah. I guess he's saying your leather goods are no good. You know, they're all this this uh, this hide must have been leprous when you harvested this uh, leather. It's all rotten away. Let's look at Luke 17 verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then said Jesus, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So we have this dominant theme of, of gratitude and also of God's provision for them in keeping with the rest of our readings and our collect. Um, and there's perhaps an underlying idea in this passage, especially when we get toward the end, that uh, a reminder that, that the gifts of God are free gifts um, and they are not taken back. Uh, so, you know, God is good to you. And even if you don't live up to being worthy of his goodness, he doesn't just take it back. Uh, all of the ones who are healed are still healed. Um, and then the gratitude that's offered has no ulterior motive to hold on to the, to the healing, for example. You know, if, if you don't say thanks, then you don't get to keep it. There's none of that. So gratitude is, is 
free and uh, and open. And and also there's there's no you know if you're really thankful then I'll give you a little bit more or something like that. It's just God is good all the time. There it is. But of course, Jesus wants his disciples to be people like this. He wants his disciples to be people who are thankful. And this is an occasion in several times, especially in Luke, where foreigners and outsiders provide examples for the disciples. And, you know, you think it would be the ones that you expect, um, the Pharisees and the scribes and and at least the Israelites, uh, who would be the outstanding examples. But again and again, it seems like it's the outsiders and the foreigners and even the children who are good examples for his disciples to follow. And he likes to point out good examples to his disciples. Now, it it doesn't say that the other nine were Samaritans. Um, we, we, we just guess about that. Um, he's traveling through that region where there would be Samaritans, of course, um, but then, you know, he's not a Samaritan, and he's there, and his disciples too. Uh, obviously, of course, word about Jesus has gotten around to them, so that ties in with the theme of prevenient grace, that uh, just as God's grace goes before us, so word about Jesus has preceded his arrival and paved the way for him, so that they're willing to call upon him when he arrives. And I think that's a good illustration of pr the idea of prevenient grace, that it gets us ready, softens us up, opens us up, um, so we're willing to accept um, the big gift of God's grace when it comes. Because if they hadn't called upon him, then he probably would have just continued on by and there would have been no story there. And then we get a 1% return of gratitude. Also, it's not really emphasized here, although it's mentioned, um, that, you know, of course, when we get to the end of the passage, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Um, and we could see, perhaps, an illustration of that same thing uh, if we look early on in the story, and we notice that, um, that he says, go show yourself to the priest. And why does he say, go show yourself to the priest? Because then that's how they get declared ritually, un, ritually, ritually clean again. They're certified, they make it their, their offering, but they're not healed when he says, go show yourself to the priest. Okay. It's after they leave and as they're going, they start to notice that, you know, with every step they're getting better. Um, so it is perhaps a sign of their faith that they leave in the first place um, because they don't see the rewards of that until they start heading out. So it's one of those little details that you can easily just kind of skip over. The life of faith is like that. It's just recently, what, what is that movie, it's, it's from the Star Wars movie, where, where it's an invisible bridge that goes between a great big... Oh, that's Indiana Jones, yeah. And um, so he has to step out. He can't see the way there's, he has to take it on faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't, we don't like it. I mean, nobody likes that that road of faith. It's it's not comfortable, and, yeah. and that's kind of the point. I think, where and obviously, they have some faith in him to start with, because they're calling on him and say, "Jesus, Master, have mercy on us," which implies that they believe that he's capable of doing something for them. What's going on in their minds? <laughs> And that faith in Jesus is already extended outside the boundaries of just the Jews. I, I was watching a documentary the other day about Samaritans, and they're like they're down to four families now, mm. and they're bringing in like Russian brides to repopulate the Samaritans. So they, of course, they're not supposed to marry outsiders, which is part of their problem why their population has dwindled. So they, they said, like, well, our uh, our high priest has abrogated that particular law in the Torah so that we can bring in some outsiders to have more children. So. 
but they still worship on Mount Gerizim. Around Mount Gerizim in Israel, I forget which part of the country that is. It's well, it's it's in the northern part. Thank you, brother.